Denny Hamlin clarifies his beef with Speedway Motorsports, NASCAR admits they have a short track problem, and let's see if your favorite driver made it into my top 10 this week. How's it going, y'all? My name is Eric. Welcome to Out of the Groove. So much NASCAR news to get to, but first, tires are one of the biggest expenses for any truck owner. With steer tires running around $500 each, you really can't afford to drive around with any of your tires underinflated or out of balance. Centromatic has solved the balancing problem with their permanent onboard balancing system. Whether it is steers, drives, or even recaps on the trailer, Centromatic will keep them all in balance all the time as you drive. Centromatic balancers are durable and carry a five-year unconditional unlimited mileage warranty that can be transferred to multiple vehicles. Centromatic balancers are proudly made in the U.S. It's a family-owned company, family-owned and operated since 1985. The balancers are available in over 2,500 locations in North America, including many of your favorite truck dealers, truck stops, tire centers, and many, many other locations. And Centromatic can ship straight to your door. Head to their website, click the top link down in the description description below. Centromatic is the world leader in balancing technology. Thank you to Centromatic for sponsoring this episode. The first step to solving any problem is admitting there is a problem. Fans, drivers, largely were not satisfied with the on-track product at Martinsville this weekend. And while on Sirius XM this week, NASCAR VP of Competition Elton Sawyer acknowledged that NASCAR does have a short track problem said, quote, we're not naive to this. We as NASCAR want our short track package to be better. We want that racing to be at the level that super speedways and our intermediate racetracks are today. I promise you, we are working as hard as we can with Goodyear and we need to work harder. That's the bottom line. We need to work harder to come to a place where, as I said a couple weeks ago, we need to figure out how to bottle up what we learned at Bristol and also what we learned the first 30 laps at Richmond last week on how that race unfolded. It sounds like NASCAR's focus is on the tires, which is probably a good place to start. Joey Logano ran nearly the first 200 laps of Sunday's race on the same set of left sides. That's a problem. We talk all the time about horsepower, but we don't need 800, 900 horsepower if the tires wear out like they did at Bristol a few weeks back. The problem is everyone, including Goodyear, was scratching their heads after Bristol. Some time has passed, hopefully. Goodyear now has a good idea of what happened over there, whether it was the track temperature, the resin, what have you. Hopefully they figure that out by now. But even if they have, can you bottle that up everywhere? Martinsville is very different than Bristol. Richmond, a week and a half ago, completely different surface than both tracks. It's interesting to hear Elton Sawyer mention the start of the Richmond race. Remember, that race began under wet weather, damp conditions, wet weather tires on the cars. Maybe that's the future. Everyone wants Goodyear to bring softer tires. Maybe they could bring some form of groove tires. All I know is that it should be all hands on deck. There needs to be a sense of urgency. I don't have my sign with me, but if I did, I would still be holding it up. Save the short tracks. Realistically, the tires are the best place to start. We saw the difference tire wear made at Bristol. I don't want to say it's easy, but it's easier to experiment with different tire compounds than it would be to completely redesign elements of the next gen car, which if you had horsepower, you'd probably have to do. If you were to change the size of the wheels, yeah, that would result in a complete overhaul of the next gen's design. Those are, I should say, potentially very expensive changes. I think it's smart for NASCAR to go to Goodyear first. As fans, can we all agree not to throw Goodyear under the bus if our favorite driver cuts a tire at a short track in the future? Can we all agree to that? Okay, okay. Hey, you, I I don't see your hand in the air. Do you can? Oh, okay. We're good. Good. All right. Let's get to work, Goodyear. Moving on. If you missed it, late last week, Denny Hamlin, NASCAR driver and team owner, got into an online altercation with Marcus Smith, president and CEO of Speedway Motorsports the company that owns many tracks on the NASCAR schedule. Things got ugly on social media, but both sides have at least apologized since then for things getting so personal. But I said this on Friday, these frustrations weren't just about the recent Sonoma Raceway repave controversy. Denny Hamlin represents the teams, Marcus Smith represents the tracks, and right now, and for the past several months if not years, both sides have been directly battling each other for a larger chunk of of NASCAR's media revenue. Denny Hamlin on his podcast, Actions Detrimental this week, offered a simple explanation of the situation from his perspective, at least. I would venture to guarantee you 
that 2311 has invested more in this sport than SMI has invested in the last 10 years. And we've done it in four years. There's a problem there, especially when we get roughly, you know, half of what, what they get on any given weekend. Under the current charter agreement, the teams collectively split roughly 25% of the media revenue while the tracks split 65%. Now, there is some confusion there. The teams might get a little more. The tracks might get a little less, depending on how the purse money is distributed. But that's not really the point Denny Hamlin is making. Give NASCAR credit for this. They have invested into many of their racetracks. NASCAR owns Daytona, Daytona Rising. They own Talladega, revamp the infield. They own Phoenix, revamp that place for the championship. NASCAR owns Michigan, which is a great racetrack. NASCAR has spent their money to create racetracks in the streets of Chicago, the LA Memorial Coliseum. NASCAR has invested in the fan experience, while SMI, Speedway Motorsports by comparison, has not. Like I said on Friday, Speedway Motorsports gets credit for things like the Charlotte Roval. You know, at a time when fans were hungry for more road course racing, Marcus Smith and his company made it happen. I think Speedway Motorsports gets credit for trying Bristol Dirt. I know it was a polarizing event, but it boosted attendance for Spring Bristol and was a ratings win on Fox. I also give Speedway Motorsports credit for reviving North Wilkesboro Speedway. Though, as I heard Jeff Gluck, Jordan Bianchi, and Denny Hamlin uh, note during their podcast this week, that project was heavily funded by public dollars, you know, COVID relief money. Again, like I said on Friday, whether it's fair or not, the public perception is that SMI is cheap. They don't invest into their facilities. They don't invest as much into the fan experience or the sports future as many believe they should. The perception is that their repaves aren't great and their reconfigurations of tracks can be hit or miss. Fair or not, that's the perception. Those comments from Denny Hamlin on his show are very interesting. This whole story is interesting as it relates to the ongoing charter and revenue negotiations. But it's also interesting timing as the entire NASCAR industry heads to Texas Motor Speedway, a once Speedway Motorsports crown jewel venue this weekend for a big time triple header. Now, before we can get to the latest edition of my Out of the Groove Power Rankings, I'm excited to share with you. Let's talk about TV ratings real quick. Again, I'm not going to do this every week, but Martinsville Speedway was the first Cup Series race on FS1 this year, not including the rain-affected clash. According to Adam Stern, FS1 got 2.19 million viewers for Sunday's Cup Series race at Martinsville, nearly flat from 2.21 million viewers last year, the race Chase Elliott returned from injury, despite immense competition from the women's Final Four championship game, which got 18 million viewers. Yeah, some of the stats from that you know, Caitlin Clark, Iowa versus South Carolina game were ridiculous. Shattering records really all tournament long, but especially here the past few weeks, NASCAR faced steep competition, yet I'm impressed, or at least I should say I'm surprised, came out of this pretty good. Uh, first race on cable to be roughly flat from last year. Again, Chase Elliott raced in both races, like Adam Stern notes there, so yeah, we don't have to talk about the Chase Elliott effect. Just goes to show you that there is still an appetite or an optimism for short track racing. You know, NASCAR fans see Martinsville on the schedule, they're inclined to tune in year after year. Just got to get the package right, because if the racing keeps looking like it did on Sunday at these short tracks, fans will tune out. They'll stop spending money on tickets, and that will be a sad day for stock car racing. A, a sad day that I hope never comes. We're not past the point of no return at this point. NASCAR, Goodyear, they still have time to make changes. Just got to get back to the drawing board. There needs to be a sense of urgency. With that being said, it's time once again for my weekly power rankings where I rank the 10 fastest overall drivers and teams in the Cup Series right now. Let's rock and roll. I've got like a four-way tie for 10th. I know that's cheating, but Alex Bowman is this close to cracking the top 10 once again. Another solid top 10 effort this weekend. I had to bump Ross Chastain out, not because he was terrible at Martinsville, just because other drivers impressed. And Bubba Wallace almost made the list. He just got his third top five finish of the year, but it was his first since Atlanta. Need to see a little more consistency. Let's start with number 10. Joey Logano is back on my list. 11th, 2nd, and 6th the past three races. And Paul Wolf used some gutsy pitch strategy at Martinsville to get him out front for more than 80 laps. I've noticed Logano immediately started running better right after he made those comments on Sirius where he said that Ford is off right now. 
Just five weeks ago, Logano was 30th in points. He's now 14th and still climbing. Joey Logano at 10. I've bumped Ty Gibbs down to number nine. I still believe he's gonna get his first win sooner rather than later, but 16th and 19th the past two weeks while his veteran teammates have contended for wins. Gibbs still has a 10.3 average finish this year, which is fantastic for a driver as young as he is, but he has slipped now to seventh in the regular season standings, which means he's slipped a couple spots in my power rankings as well. At number eight, I'm a man of my word. I said last week, if Chase Elliott can string together a couple of top five finishes, he'll make my list. Two straight top fives for Chase Elliott, if not for that course cutting penalty at Coda, might be three straight top fives. His 11.5 average finish is fantastic, among the best in the sport, but it was really great to see him up front leading laps at Martinsville this weekend, something we haven't seen from Chase Elliott much since the injury. At number seven, I've got Christopher Bell. What is up with this team? He had that four Four race stretch where he looked really good. Won at Phoenix. Charged up into the top five late at both Richmond and Coda. Led a bunch of laps at Bristol. But those four races have been bookended by two just terrible races. Las Vegas was ugly. Finished 33rd after multiple incidents. And Martinsville was deja vu. Qualified badly. Multiple incidents. Finished 35th. When he's on, Christopher Bell may be the best driver at Joe Gibbs Racing. But right now he's not quite as consistent as his veteran teammates. I've got Tyler Reddick in the sixth spot. Three straight top 10 finishes, if not for that bad strategy call at Bristol, would probably be six straight top 10 finishes. He's not leading as many laps as his fellow Toyota teammates at Joe Gibbs Racing, but he's in the mix every week at a variety of racetracks. Tyler Reddick at number six. At number five, Ryan Blaney. He is still the only Ford in the top 10 in points that's worth something. Just scored his fourth top five finish of the year. Very encouraging after a rough couple of weeks for the defending champion. At number four, I've got Denny Hamlin. I'm not sure what kind of adjustments they made there on the final stop at Martinsville, but they didn't work. And then obviously the strategy called a pit with two to go didn't work either. He still won a stage, so I would consider this a successful weekend. And for a good chunk of stage two at least, Hamlin looked like he was on track to win his fourth short track race of the year, if you include the clash. It was a big weekend though for Hendrick Motorsports, so moving up one spot, number three, Kyle Larson. He's finished second and third the last two weeks. He's won the pole two races in a row, won the opening stage at Martinsville. He's also the first driver to reach 400 laps led on the season. Kyle Larson at three at number two. My top two keep going back and forth. Uh, this week it's Martin Truex Jr. I think Martinsville was Martin's first bad race of the year. And he still finished 18th and collected six stage points. And to be fair, Denny Hamlin was really the only Joe Gibbs racing car that looked capable of contending for the win. And that did surprise me considering how good Joe Gibbs racing was at both Bristol and Richmond. I guess JGR just prefers tracks where left side tires wear out. Martin Truex Jr. at two, which means back on top, is William Byron. Third win of the season. This one's a no-brainer. His three wins have come at three very different tracks. Super Speedway, Road Course, Short Track. He's the winningest driver in the next-gen era. Hey, last year, it took him until mid-May to get his third win of the season. Right now, Byron's on pace to win like 12 or 13 races this season, which you know, isn't going to happen. But could he get to 10 wins? You know, we talked about parity the first year of the next gen, but it's pretty clear that Hendrick and Joe Gibbs have figured this car out better than anyone else. Hendrick and Gibbs have combined to win every race this season outside of, you know, Daniel Suarez, who won in Atlanta by inches. I don't think Byron will get to 10 wins this year, but the fact that this is an honest conversation we could have tells you how dominant the 24 car is at the moment. William Byron at number one. There's my top 10 after Martinsville. Again, maybe I should do my top 12 or top 15 because from like eighth on back, it is so close. A lot of short tracks the last few weeks. It'll be good to go back to a, a bigger mile and a half. We'll see if this list shuffles quite a bit after Texas, but there you go. Let me know down in the comments below if you agree or disagree with any of my rankings. That is going to do it for this episode, y'all. Thank you so much for tuning in. Leave a like if you enjoyed, subscribe if you're new to the channel. We talk NASCAR day in, day out here on Out of the Groove. As always, a huge thank you to my very generous Patreon supporters. Speaking of Texas, I will be at Texas Motor Speedway this weekend. Hope to see some of y'all there at the track. Hopefully going to get some good coverage. Also got some guests joining the show later this week. We'll get to share those clips and that content with you very, very soon. Have a wonderful rest of your Tuesday, folks. I will catch you in the next video.